welcome. Welcome, welcome to Intentional Conversations podcast, where we intersect topics of diversity, equity, and inclusion with leadership in business. We're just giving it a moment or two for our virtual learning community to get settled. And we're so glad you're here. We've been expecting you. And as we share every single week, we never take for granted when people show up because it lets us know that you value this time. And we certainly want to make sure that we make it worth your while. I am Dr. Nika White. My pronouns are she, her, and I am the proud founder and lead principal consultant for NWC. And we have prepared a great show for you today as we attempt to do every single week. And we hope that you will sit back and enjoy. If you will, go to the chat section and let us know where you're joining the conversation from. It's always interesting to us to see all the different geographies that are represented, not only in the United States, but even outside of the country. And we don't take that lightly. Here at Intentional Conversations Vodcast, I also want you to know that if you're part of our Zoom community, then cameras are welcomed and encouraged, but they certainly aren't required. We are always delighted to have any of you here in any capacity that makes sense for you. Even if you're just listening in the background, we find that very valuable as well. This is an opportunity for me to say hello to the LinkedIn Live community that is joining us as well. We tend to believe that the experience is optimized, though, if you're part of the Zoom community. So my team will share into the comment section there a link if you want to hop on over here. Or if not, and you want to stay put, then we're glad you're here in whatever capacity. At NWC, we really do value disability inclusion. So with that said, we always like to encourage everyone to take advantage of the closed caption feature that we have enabled for your benefit. And so keep that in mind as well. Okay, so I'm seeing folks go to the chat and we love that as we're building up our community and our audience. So great. I cannot wait for you to meet our guest co-host today. It's gonna to be such a riveting conversation, I have no doubt. See, Maryland's represented, so it's fantastic. We are based in Greenville, South Carolina, by the way. That's where we're headquartered, but we are 100% remote, so our colleagues are all over. And um, we're just grateful to be in community with each of you today. Okay, welcome again, Intentional Conversations podcast. Enjoy the show. Conversations begin indeed. And I want to remind you while we're letting the conversations begin that the chat and the comments section are available for us to be in community with each other. And so if something is said throughout this hour that resonates, I want you to take to the chat. If you feel inclined to show forth some level of affirmation for whoever is speaking at the moment, then go to the chat. If you have a great resource that you think this entire community could benefit from, you know what to do. Go to the chat. Let's keep the conversations going. It's our way of being able to get as proximate as possible to each other in this virtual learning environment. So I want to kick us off today. You know, if you've been a part of our podcast community, that one of the things that we love to do is just highlight some national observances that we feel are important for our audience to be aware of. So while the month is winding down, this is National Mentoring Month, the month of January. And I often say, I think that being a mentor to someone is one of the most selfless things a person can do to add value to another individual. So even though the month may be winding down, continue to think about those opportunities to pay it forward and to mentor someone in your service. Circle. I know that they will gain great value from it. Next week, I'll be celebrating my one-year baby book anniversary. Yes, one year for Inclusion Uncomplicated, a Transformative Guide to Simplify DEI, again, which was published by Forbes Books. And I'm super excited that we have reached the one-year mark almost. And I definitely would love for this community to help um, celebrate with me. If you know of folks who have not yet gotten their copy and you have your copy, then feel free to share with them that there's multiple ways to get the content. They can go to um, Amazon, of course and you can get the book on audio through Kindle. You can get it um, in hard copy. We're soon going to be releasing um, a paperback version of it, but um, support, support, support. And remember those Amazon reviews, they do make a difference. Thank you all so very much. 
With the new year comes a lot of new refreshes and updates and no different with NWC. We have refreshed all of our marketing materials and a huge shout out to my marketing partners at Peculiar who have been rocking it with me for years, y'all. I'm talking years. One of the things we hear often from folks who reach out to us is when we ask a question about what made you contact us is our marketing. And it is fabulous if I can say so myself. And so I'm so proud of the team. We have a new refreshed website, whether it's Nico White Consulting, which is just nicowhite.com or my speaking website, nicowhitespeaks.com. New speaker reel, lots of things going on. So go check us out and let us know what you think. We value your opinion. Also, you know that I have a LinkedIn learning course that released in June of last year. We have reached over 17,000 learners in that course. And I have two new courses that are going to be coming out this quarter. Uh, one is around the intersection between AI, artificial intelligence, and DEI. Big, big topic. You don't want to miss that. And organizational leadership accountability for equity and inclusion. And so I hope that you will be on the lookout for those new courses and that you will check them out. Thank you for those who have supported so far. If you love Intentional Conversations podcast and you think there's great value in the content that's being shared and the community that we've built, then I also want you to know that we do also have this show available in podcast capacity for those who love to get their content in that way. And so for those who are always on the go, then you know, feel free to share with them that if you can't join us live for the podcast, you can catch the replay because we do record it, but you also can catch it on podcasts wherever you like to listen to your podcast. Now, this is a part of the show where I give you a little bit of what you have to look forward to in upcoming weeks by way of our guest co-host. And so I'm super excited to share with you that we have Marisha Reese, who's going to be joining us as a co-host on kicking off the month of February. They have a great conference coming up. She's with the Winters Group, and I just can't wait to be in community with her and have you all also hear about some of the great things that she and her firm are doing in this space. And then following that Friday on the 9th, I have Tammy Darmel Moore, who's going to be joining us. Again, great individual. She does a lot of work in Africa, and I cannot wait for her to share with you about some of those experiences. So mark your calendars, plan to be here. And on the 16th, we have Amira Barger. If you don't know Amira, she is an amazing professional, not only from a marketing communications perspective, but also from a DEI. So she blends those two worlds beautifully. And I cannot wait for us to be in conversation mid-February. So mark those dates and times. And then to round us out at the end of the month, we have Dr. Julia Wiener, who is one of our consultant partners, and she is amazing. I cannot wait for you to be in conversation with her. So I hope you all will take note of these dates and times and meet us here at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time on Friday, every Friday in the month of February and then thereafter. So now it is my great pleasure to do a formal introduction of today's guest co-host of Intentional Conversations podcast. And as I normally do, I will read her bio and then I will invite her to greet this audience in her own way. And I want you to be aware of the accolades, the credentials, the experiences that our guest co-host shows up to today's conversation. I think it will give you a deeper appreciation of why we invited her and why we're so honored to have her grace us with her presence and her wisdom today. Um, Olawa Tomi, she goes by Tomi, Fadeyi Jones is an HR leader and practitioner with over 20 years in the field. She has worked with a myriad of companies in multiple industries with varying organizational structures. In 2018, she launched My HR Consultant, LAC, a boutique firm founded on the belief that HR works best as an integrated part of business operations. Tomi brings years of experience and her unique business forward perspective to each client engagement. Tomi's areas of expertise include organization design and structure, performance and talent management, compensation, diversity, equity, and inclusion, process improvement, learning solutions, and workforce planning. Tomi holds a graduate degree in business administration and an undergraduate degrees in human resource and marketing. She also holds executive certificates in strategic change management, leading diversity, equity, equity and inclusion, and employee wellness and stress management. Tomi is actively engaged in her community and works to advance to social action. She currently serves on the board of Patients for Affordable Drugs, the only independent national patient organization focused exclusively on achieving policy changes to lower the price of prescription drugs. She just recently ended her term as president of the board of directors for Horizons Greater Washington, a nonprofit organization designed to empower economically disadvantaged students to realize their full potential. 
Tomi is a proud member of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated and stays engaged through her local alumni chapter. When she's not behind a laptop, she can be found officiating regional swim meets, exploring her newly discovered artistic interest, working through her K-drama watch list, and spending time with her family. And so, Intentional Conversations Vodcast community, you know what we do at this time. While I stop sharing my screen, you find those accolades, you find those words of affirmation, you go to the chat, but you let our guest co-host know, tell me how much we are so appreciative of her being here with us today. And welcome, my friend. I'm so glad you're here. Thank you for your time. Thank you for saying yes to our invite. And one of the things that we often like to start out with on the show before our guest co-host engages really in depth around their experiences and the questions that we have, you know, kind of preset for the, the show is to share with us what do we not know about you from reading your bio or hearing your bio that I just read, or maybe from going to your LinkedIn profile that you are willing to share with this community. Welcome. Sure. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm so excited to be here. Um, I thought when we talked about this that I might start with uh, what all my titles, right? Title, <laughs> outside of work titles. So, um, so the first title I think I would start with is daughter, right? So I'm a daughter of immigrants. They're from Nigeria, um, and they are the absolute, you know, best parents that you could you could dream of. We always say that they're better parents for children than adults, but they're they're adjusting <laughs> as well. Um, uh, for those who are interested in um, birth order, I am a second born of four. I have uh, two sisters and a brother. Um, also, am a, a grateful sister for my brother who is active duty military. So we've uh, had that experience with him um, as well. I am a wife. Um, met my husband uh, first day of freshman year of college, and uh, we just celebrated our 25th uh, last summer with a dream trip to Bali. That was a, a crazy fun oh. trip. Um, one of my bucket list locations. So we had a great time there. Um, I am also a mom, a very proud mom of two boys. Um, uh, my fun family fact is my boys are five years apart and they share a birthday. Um, so that is where my Virgo side comes into play with planning everything. So they are five years apart. They share a birthday, which they actually love, which I, I like that they they love that. Um, my eldest is um, overseas uh, doing his master's. And uh, my youngest is a senior in high school. So four months or so till uh, empty nesting. Um, I love um, all of this. I know. <laughs> I know. I love all of this. <laughs> Trying to figure out what the next phase of life looks like. <laughs> uh, so I think uh, along with being a mom, I think my intersection or caveat there is that I am a swim mom, which those who are in aquatic world know that that's a whole thing. Um, so many, 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 many early mornings, uh, I'm kind of forced to be a morning person uh, with our 4 a.m. wake ups to drive to the pool and, um, you know, many weekends in the humidity, officiating meets and things like that. So um, it's a it's a crazy, crazy world, but excited because he he just did sign to swim collegiately. So we're super excited for him. Um, and uh, so, so yeah, happy to share more about that. Um, and then I think also just a, a friend. I am blessed to have an awesome community of great friends to kind of live life with, um, including my great friend, Shaloma Gugan, who actually connected us. Um, so I'll give her a shout out on the call as well. Um, and um, and then um, again, I just, I think uh, I'm a high introvert. I always do put that out there um, because I probably will take a nap after this today, <laughs> but, uh, but I am a high, high introvert, um, which people often don't believe about me. But um, so that's where I go to my, you know, art and K-dramas to, to, you know, re, uh, reinvigorate my energy. But I am super excited to be here. Uh, thank you for having me. Looking forward to the conversation. I am so super excited to have you. And you know, you've shared so many great insights that I, I'm trying to think, where do I want to go next? <laughs> there's so much to unpack about, yeah. first and foremost, how in which you introduce yourself, which I love, I love, love, love. I, I take notice, especially in this day and era, where so oftentimes when someone will ask us to introduce ourselves, it's always about 
our position, our yeah. work, our title from a, a marketplace perspective. Yeah. And what you just um, demonstrated and modeled for us is the importance of seeing ourselves as full whole beings yeah. to where all of our experiences are intertwined to make us who we are and not just who we are in the workplace, right? Yeah. So I love that. And um, we're watching and, and, and thank you for modeling that. I think that's so critically important. The other thing I took notice of is we have a lot in common. So you mentioned you are a high introvert. So I'm the same <laughs> way, but I feel like I feel like I am actually I'm growing to be an introvert because I used to always describe myself as an extrovert, but yeah. I'm also an ambivert to where if I have been peopling a lot, it's like yes. I need to stop peopling for a moment. Yes. And so, and I guess I'm curious, is that kind of what you mean by maybe a high introvert? It's like, okay. Yeah. Okay, I've heard it described as ambivert, but I've never heard it described as high introvert. So you're yeah. teaching me and I, I love this. I love, you know, reframed in different language and how in which we refer to different things. And so um, that's valuable because it certainly has a lot of connectivity to this broad conversation of diversity, right? That's um, right. And, and it's funny because I actually I use that term peopling with my family and, and my awesome. boys will say after their week, because I, I have one that one of each. And he'll say, I just did a lot of peopling today. I need a minute. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> or, I'm done peopling. That's right. Or they'll look I at me. I know. <laughs> you did a lot of peopling I know. today, didn't you? So it is a term that we use because I it is it is important to kind of understand where your energy comes from and yes. what it takes to, you know, get that energy back to be able to then go do something else. You have to refill yes. to be able to go give somewhere yes. else. Yes. So, 100 yeah. percent And I so value that. And so it's almost like I feel I feel seen when someone else can. <laughs> Um, communicate that about their preferences as well. Okay. And then um, you and I had a chance to kind of chat it up a little bit. And you did introduce to this conversation that you have a son that is overseas, specifically Tokyo. I don't know if you mentioned exactly where he is. And so you and I share that in common because we were having a moment where we were talking about how our kids are really um, bold and courageous and they're so well-traveled. My daughter's living overseas right now and she did her graduate program overseas and, um, and how we love for our kids. And um, you kind of jokingly share it with me that your son did a lot of research ahead of time because he wanted to know, can I find somebody who can, you know, retwist my hair, relock my hair, you know, when I need it. And, and we kind of chuckled and said, you know, that's important because while we want to have all of these cultured experiences, sometimes the hindrance is that when we do our research, maybe we don't find where there are connection points that allow us to feel like we belong there and that we could be, our needs can be met in those areas. And so I thought that was really interesting and certainly um, a, a common ground that you and I share with our kids' experiences. Uh, and then you talked about swimming. Yes. And I didn't share this with you when we were chatting before, but while my son is nowhere on the level of, it sounds like your son, where he is like now, you know, swimming, um, you know, collegially and, but he was a swimmer. And I remember um, thinking to myself when I would show up at those swim mates, they were like neighborhood swim mates or whatever, swim mates, thinking, why are we the only ones? <laughs> We're the only ones. And so all the things that come into play when you think about being a person of color, particularly like a black person, um, African American, and that is part of your world. And you're having to navigate a lot to figure out how do I really help these people to know that don't look like me, that this is part of my world. I need you to be thinking about that as well. Right. So I think I kind of want to go there a little bit now yeah, and just yeah, have you absolutely. to talk about that because <laughs> you have made this, this has become, we know that what our kids are kind of involved in becomes our lives as well, mm -hmm. right? And so take us on your journey and what you have experienced and what you have observed and, and how you feel like the world needs to be thinking differently about those spaces as it relates to Black and Brown people. You know, it's it's definitely been a journey because um, it's not something I knew anything about. I mean, I was a runner. I did track, you know, in, in high school and my husband was basketball. So this whole thing was new to all of us. And we started really with them learning how to swim because of summer camp. They actually were in lacrosse mm -hmm. camp and they took them to the pool midday. And I wanted them to, I wanted to make sure they could fend for themselves. Um, but they ended up just gravitating both of them towards it. The younger one, um, definitely on a more serious level, but both of them were in that world. So I think the turning point was with when my younger son at one point had said he wanted to quit. Um, he probably mm -hmm. was 11 or 12. And we were trying to mm -hmm. figure out exactly what was going on and why. So we were asking yeah. him, why do you want to quit? A while to get there, but ultimately he just was tired of being the only one. Mm -hmm. 
mm-hmm. um, on the team that he was at. He was the only one. They would go to certain champs meets. At one meet, he said it was me and a coach. And that mm-hmm. was it, right? So he just was getting tired of that. And I think we underestimate the impact that that has um, on a little soul, on a little body. Right. You know? right. Not anybody else that looks like you, especially, you know, parents at swim meets, we're not close. We're up in the stands. Um, so I had asked him, give me a chance. Let me look around. Um, and mm-hmm. so I did. I looked around at different teams and um, I saw one from afar. It was a very diverse team. The coaches, the interaction was different challenge is we drive right so we drive 45 minutes to an hour which is why we're up at four to get to his five o'clock practice um it takes us about an hour to get back home he gets dressed and then i take him to school right Um, it's it's the sacrifice summer league we joined um you know again this awesome community of friends we have um pulled us in again in the summer we drive an hour to get to the meets. Um, Thankfully, I'm in a place where I can do that. If I wasn't, we wouldn't be able to do it. So we are going to um, the inclusion. We found it and we have to go and and take him there, right? Yeah, yeah. The thing is, once we found that, he just blossomed. He grew. And it's just interesting how not having that, I think, was affecting his experience, but it was also... Uh, affecting his ability to be at his best, right? Because once we found that he is qualifying for championship meets and we're going to nationals. And like I mentioned a, few, a bit ago, he, you know, signed to swim um, collegiately and he's go- he's swimming division one, which he's super excited about. So now caveat, we did have to tell him once we get to that collegiate level, you have to be prepared because it's probably going to look different again right so we did have that discussion with him so he's prepared for that when when he gets there because the numbers change again Um, oh yeah it's a very very small percentage of us um in collegiate swimming i think it's something like maybe one percent um in in division one um so he so we're just stressing to him he will need to find that community outside of the pool um, yes. Once get to the college. So it, it and then the other thing I will say also is when you look around on deck, a lot of the mm-hmm. officials there aren't a lot of us on deck. Right. Either. So um, even even though it's something that probably people are like, why are you doing that? I I did get certified as an official, so I am on deck. Um, I do work the the meets for stroke and turn officiating, and I talk to our kids on deck. We are impartial as as officials. But I will say when they get out of the water, great swim, great job. That was a legal one. Good job. You know, just to, you know, kind of, uh, you know, fist bump them and things like that yes. when, when they're getting in and out of the water. I just think it's important for them to see us too. So, um, so yeah, so it's, it's a big, big, big part of our, our family, our world. Um, and I'm looking forward to maybe being able to make that impact at the collegiate level. We'll see what that looks like shortly. Um, mm. but, uh, but it's been, it has been a journey. It's, it's a, it's an interesting, um, community in, in aquatics. Yeah. I, I'm so endeared to the story for so many reasons. Um, you know, I think first and foremost, it takes, um, into consideration some of our everyday pastime hobbies, you know, moments of joy, and it relates it to the complexity that lack of inclusion, yes. um, you know, creates, for us, and I, I know that your your son, your sons are probably very appreciative to have a mom that was willing to stay the course, you know, not let them kind of give up on yeah. their goals, their passions, and to find and make the sacrifice. I heard you say you drove like forty five minutes to an hour away, and that is a big sacrifice. Um, and so, and then even becoming certified as an official, I mean, that is, that is really modeling. How do we help combat um, right. those times when we feel like barriers are keeping us from being great in whatever capacity right. and, and, and not everyone, I do want to acknowledge and not everyone is in a place of privilege to be able to make the sacrifices like your family has. And so um, I, I definitely um, and and hopeful that this will pay dividends back to you all for the sacrifices that you made. And even the conversations of preparing him once he goes to college that, look, it may change again. Right. But you just remember that this may be only temporary. Okay. Um, and then again, how you're lifting up others. And so yeah. I, I just want to commend you on, on all of that. Yeah. Um, 
I like words. And you, you, you made a statement that gave me pause. You said we had to go to the inclusion and it gave me pause. Um, because in some ways I was like, yes, you're, you're figuring out, which is what we do, right? We're, we're told to figure it out, be resilient. And sometimes, you know, we, we need to be able to just kind of settle in this mindset of ease because we deserve that as well. But to say we had to go to the inclusion, it just stopped me in my tracks because I think that is what all of us, so many of us, I should say, are experiencing is that we have to create our own inclusion. Yeah. Yes. And I know. that is exhausting. Yeah. It is. That is exhausting. It is. it is. Yeah, it is. And you know, what's interesting is when I, I'm able to relate this back to work and in the workplace, because what happens when we adults are in a place where we're the only, and we've gotten to the point like he did, where you're tired of it, they go find the inclusion. Right. So we lose people. That's where we have people that leave our organizations. They find it somewhere else. And I will say with this new generation, they are even less patient um, than maybe we, yeah. right? If they get there, they're not willing to wait a year or willing to wait for us to create the inclusion. They will go find it somewhere else, um, yeah. right? Because it's inhibiting yeah. their ability to be at their best. That's the one thing I noticed is, you know, this is, it's he was the same kid, right? He was the same kid but in a different environment, he was able to blossom. So if we don't create it, people will go find it, right? And so we we see that quite, quite often um, in the work yeah. as well. Yeah. It is, it is exhausting, it really is, but I think it's even more exhausting to live in a space where you don't feel like you're included, right? That's even more draining. Yeah. So I want to, I want to shift and I want to talk about your experience in this space. Obviously, mm -hmm. I read your, your bio, so we are familiar with um, all of the different credentials that you have. But what are some of maybe the top key lessons that you've learned from your experience in the DEI space? I, I think the, the biggest lesson is that it's just misunderstood. I think, and, and it's been, and it's become unnecessarily complicated. I, I thought it was, you know, I love the title of your book. It's just become unnecessarily complicated <laughs> and it is misunderstood. And I think the idea that D and I impacts every single person, it really does impact every single person. We were doing a session and a gentleman said, you know, well, this isn't for me. Right. And I remember saying, um, you know, everybody has a gender or sex, everybody has some kind of religion or not, everybody has, yeah. you know, a family member, like everybody in some way or fashion, DNI impacts everybody. And it's not always about fixing a problem, because that's the other thing we'll hear is, well, problem are we trying to fix here? Because I don't think yeah. we have a problem. Sometimes it's just, where are you today and how can you be better? And, and we struggle with that because if they feel like they are fine and there are no complaints, then they don't think it's necessary or they need it. It's not always to fix a problem. Sometimes it's just to take you from good to better to best and to make sure yes. that as your population changes. It's about human beings. As you bring in new human beings, you have to look to see what their needs are and wants and continually morph. So you're never done, right? And folks are like, well, when do we know that we've succeeded? Right. When do we, when are we done with this? You're not, and you're never done. And that's, <laughs> flexible. it's fluid. So the focus of DNI, my focus on a particular group at different times, but it does impact every single person. And I think that's, you know, the whole idea of it just being misunderstood, I think has been the biggest challenge probably, you know, the last three years or so. Yeah, and I couldn't agree more. It was actually the impetus of what, um, you know, motivated me to write the book, Inclusion Uncomplicated. I think that we do need to try to make it more practical. We do need yeah. to try to help people to understand it um, in a way that helps them to engage in the conversations mm -hmm. and the dialogue and be a part of mm -hmm. um, the body of work. And I love how you brought to the conversation that we aren't fixing a problem. And I do think that a lot of people see it as a problem. Right. And and I, I like the reframe because in my book, I talk about obligation versus this opportunity. Too right. many of us are showing up to this conversation, seeing it as obligatory work from a standpoint of, well, what can I do to help DEI out instead of what can DEI do to make us a stronger society, right? Better operating team, a, a better organization, an employer destination. So all of those things. And so I, I appreciate um, you sharing that. So you often, Tommy, emphasize the notion of or versus and in DEI. Yeah. So can you elaborate on this concept and this significance for you? 
Sure. You know, many times they look at DEI as is the zero sum game, right? right. If it's a plus here, it's a minus here. And what I stress to them is that it's necessary and important to look at it as an and. And so if we talk about recruiting, for example, it'll be, well, if I am looking for diversity, then it's diversity or quality. It's diversity yeah. or excellence, diversity or, you know, um, yeah. credentials, right? And I'm, and yeah. I know you're looking for diverse candidates and qualified, right? It, it's all in one. It's an intersection of them. And you're looking yeah. for excellence through diversity or excellence and diversity, right? It, it's not one or the other. Um, so I try to use less of the or and more of the and when they're talking mm. about and I when it comes to clients. Um, one of the funny ones would be recognition days, right? There's so many yeah. recognition days. <laughs> oh, we can't recognize everybody. So we have to choose this one or this right. one for this month. And I'm like, no, be creative and figure out a way to highlight all of them. One could be, you just have an open calendar that is accessible to everybody and you put them on, you allow people to add or to, you know, you just yes. have to be creative and think of ways to make it work. <laughs> How do we make it work versus this or this? I think when it comes to DE and I, um, so and and um, so I would say that. And the other thing is the word but, right? So we try not to say but and try to say and um, instead, mm -hmm. so you're not negating one or the other. Right. Uh, so DE and I, it's not exclusionary. It's not an yeah. or and. How are we adding and and making this place better? Yeah, no, very well stated. I couldn't agree more. And um, I also think that what it does is it places emphasis on the the fact yes. that diversity is already here and happening. Correct. You know, we don't Correct. have to do anything to create diversity. Exactly. So it's almost like, why do we keep talking about right. it in that context? You know, That's right. and so right. now we have to do a lot to create and foster inclusion and equity and all the other things and belonging. But from a diversity perspective, it is here and happening. That's it is, right. it is around us, you know, so I, I appreciate that point. That's exactly right. Yeah. Okay. So I want to talk about um, your work and, and the way in which you like to guide and, um, you know, support your clients. Right. How do you approach the seamless integration of DEI into business operations? And specifically what I'm interested in you sharing here are examples of successful integration and how specifically you integrate HR as an mm -hmm. integral part business operations, because there's a connection point, obviously, between DEI and HR. And it sounds like your world really believes in combining those two in very specific and intentional ways. Yeah. Yeah. That was some one thing that, you know, is a career in HR that can be frustrating is that it seems like the business is running on one end and then every once in a while they'll include HR, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Really, you know, it works best when you're integrated because HR can bring things in at the very beginning of the work that helps the work again become better and product. So I think for me, when I'm looking at integration, it's DEI is not a lens that you put on top of things to evaluate it at the end. Um, it's the, it's building structures and the processes that include a DE and I. And I always focus on foundations and structures and areas that are not people dependent. So if I leave or this person leaves, it doesn't go with them. So you want to focus on those structures, the policies, the procedures, the bylaws, the requirements, the agendas, the regulations, frameworks, things like that, um, that are core to the organization that weave in DE&I and HR. So when I leave or individuals leave, it doesn't go with them. Those are the things that you want to put it in the places that are hard to change, right? When I talk to yeah. a group about putting it in their bylaws, for example, <laughs> it was interesting because they said, well, but if we put it in the bylaws, if it needs to be edited, then we have to go for votes and things. I said, that's the point. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that is the point. The point. <laughs> it's not easy. If you make a, anybody can change a procedure, right? Because that's not something that is, is, yeah. is you know, but you want it in policies and bylaws yes. and things like that, because you don't, you want it in somewhere that's has many eyes on it in order to change it, right? It takes a lot of work to change it. That's where you want it to be. You want it to be integrated and it can't be easily changed. So right. every once in a while, we'll work on a roadmap for a client to create a roadmap for them on you know, how do they get from where they are today to where they want to be. And so we'll look across functions, right? We'll look at board composition. We'll look at yeah. 
leaders performance and and bonus goals we'll look at um uh, behavioral expectations um what do your job postings look like what do your your new hire orientation look like um if you are an organization that does project work or research um you know how are you putting your research teams together how are you deciding who um you put on on leadership for certain projects so it's kind of going back to the core first step needs assessment um, and then working all the way through, not getting to the end and then saying, okay, let's now put our DEI lens on this and see if it works, right? That it's too, it's too late. Yes. At that point. So yeah. But that's how we yeah. look at integration is just really at the beginning and looking at the core, core, core functions within the organization. Yeah. No, that's really important. If it's not policy, then how can you expect for it really to stick and, and exactly. happen? Right. And policy is also what then um, instigates accountability. Because if this is our policy, there's some compliance, that's you know, right. there's a compliance nature around it. And so how are we holding people accountable to those policies that we are now implementing so that consistently across the board, we all are governing ourselves accordingly. So that is really critical. Yeah. Um, one of the other things that you often talk about, Tommy, is um, we need to stop bringing people along mm -hmm. with our journey. And that may seem contradictory for some folks. So I want to give you a chance to explain your perspective on that yeah. and while you feel so deeply about it. Yeah. So I, I do often say that my perspective on HR um, is, is different. Um, <laughs> it can be different. Um, so when I do mention this, I think it does take folks are back because it's a little bit different than how you think about DNI. Um, mm -hmm. But what I found is that a lot of organizations and people spend a lot of time and energy focused on converting those who are not already on board. We're trying to convince them that it's important and that it matter or we matter. We're continuously writing business cases. And, and at one point it just hit me that, you know, it, we really need to focus on making change and impact with those who are already in and those who already understand and are with us, moving forward with them towards results, right? Communicating. So if we're talking about functions and um, policies and things like that. If you work with those who are already in with you and you're writing policies about what is tolerated and not tolerated within the organization and having consequences related to those, at some point, people will self-select in or out. Right. If they don't want that and that's what the organization requires, they will self-select out. Right. Yes. If they don't want to do it or they don't want to. And that's what you want then at that point voluntarily. Or they will decide that, yes, I'm going to do that and they'll stay. So if we keep trying to focus on those who you know, aren't on board and we keep focusing on trying to pull them with us, you won't move forward or make any progress. I kind of look at it as, you know, you're pulling this, you know, heavy bag behind you. You're focusing on educating and convincing and training and then measuring training and then measuring behavior change and then repeat because the behavior change <laughs> will show that it didn't work because they weren't on board. So then you do yeah. it again, rather than focus on those who are already ready, right? Creating those fronts and then let themselves select out if it's something that they don't want to do, right? Or that they yeah. should to do. So a little bit of a different perspective because I know we're focused on, you know, we got to make sure people know how important this is, but at some point you're spending your energy and resources there. You're just not progressing. Yeah, no, that's so good. I want to lean into that a bit. One of the things I value every single week about these conversations is the intentionality that we place on bringing different perspectives to the conversation. Yeah. I think that there's this mindset that there's only one way to do this work and there's not, you know, it's very nuanced because it depends on so many other variables. And um, in, in some ways, I deeply agree with you. It resonates with me. You know, it's almost um, to the, the the level of when I like to share, we're not always going to be able to change hearts and minds, but if yes. we can at least change people's behavior to where they're willing to say, I'm going to be compliant with whatever your non-negotiables are okay. so that I don't disrupt the work that you're trying to create, the level of inclusivity and equity and belonging you're trying to create, then okay, we can coexist, right? Within exactly. the mission, the confines of this organization. Right. Um, exactly. Because so we know do... that that impacts the culture, right? And yeah. so if you really are, are um, committed to this work, then you should, as, as organizational leaders, be concerned about who you're bringing in and how they're going to operate within that space. I don't care that maybe your bestseller. I don't care that they may be, yeah. you know, the, the most influential. If they are not holding the core values of what you were saying as an organization that you deem to be really important 
then then that's an issue. And we have to we have we need more leaders that are willing to boldly and bravely kind of interrogate those those thoughts for themselves. Otherwise, you do find yourself in this cycle. Um, when I was writing my book, you know, one of the chapters it talks about who is this book for? Yeah. And I answered that question by talking about it. Who is this book not for? And it's that's not true. for those who dug their heels in and they said, I don't believe in this work. This work is not valuable. I want to continue to living, you know, in a society to where oppression is like yeah. the forefront. And uh, yeah, I'm not talking to those no, individuals, but if you're kind of on the fence because you're unaware, or maybe you just don't know how to engage, now I can work with you, right? Yeah. And there's a, there's some parallels to that that mentality yeah. to what I'm hearing that you're sharing now as well. You yeah. want to comment on that? Yeah, because sometimes, you know, we'll be, they'll say, well, we're preaching to the choir, right? That whole yeah. thing. We're, we're talking to people who are already invested. We really need to be talking to those. And I said, no, you don't, right? No, you don't. Yeah. And sometimes it takes addressing that one high performer who doesn't adhere to the behavioral expectation for people to say, oh, they're serious, <laughs> right? Yeah. They will take action if people don't adhere to these behavioral expectations. And you can do you can do whatever you want, let's say, when you're not here. But once you come in here, this is yes. what we expect, right? Absolutely. So you, this is what you expect when you're here. Once you leave, your life is yours. Um, although yes. although I will say every once in a while, HR, we will get a Facebook printout of something somebody posted. <laughs> on social out, media, yeah. Right? You got to so, have, have some parameters around exactly. that. Exactly. So there's still maybe some parameters around that. However, when you're here, here's what we expect of people to work here or to be here or to exist here. And if you can't sign up to that, then again, then people may self-select out. Right. Yeah. And there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing yeah. wrong with self-selecting out. I mean, I think that that's part of the apprehension that a lot of organizations have about being very intentional about who we are, what we represent from a value perspective, because they feel like if we if we if we are so direct in stating that, then for those who don't want to align with that, we may lose them. And my question is, but so what? Why are you concerned okay. about that? Okay. You know, and um, so yeah, it's definitely it's definitely a, a commonplace conversation that I know a lot of organizations um, navigate. Um, yeah. yeah. So we're going to be shifting momentarily to invite the audience to present questions or comments um, to our okay. guest co-host today. And um, I want to just all let you know that if you have a question, if you're part of our live Zoom community, then you can let us know by simply using the raise hand feature. And that allows me to know that you're willing to be added to the spotlight and invited to unmute yourself to share. If you're here and you just want your question to be presented on your behalf, place it into the chat. We'll try to get to as many of those as possible. If you're watching LinkedIn Live and you have questions place them into the comments. We're bringing all of those um, questions and curiosities over into this community. And so we'll take as many questions as we can as time allows. So while you're percolating on maybe the curiosities that are coming forth, I'm going to go to the next question for Tell Me, okay. and then we will uh, we'll shift. Okay, so I want to talk about, um, you know, how can we work around the one is too many mentality? You know, we often hear the one, the only, the, the few, the only, the lonelies, right? And sometimes there are organizations that their belief is, okay, if I give you one, then that's it. I need you to stop complaining about this. I need you yeah. to stop talking. I need you to stop pressuring us, right? We have one. And then that's a challenge. But can yeah. you elaborate on this concept and its implications for DEI efforts? Yeah, so I think there are two perspectives on the one is too many, right? So I think when um, when you're so goals focused, numeric goal goals focused, right? When they're so metric focused, right, that they want to make sure that they meet that met metric goal, that's where we start to see a lot of well, but we met the goal, isn't that enough? Or you know, but we recruited that, you know, the person isn't that enough, right? So um, that's where I would say, how are you measuring your success uh, with, with DE and I, right? Because there are times where it's not the number, it's the experience yes. or the engagement that really, you know, tells you how successful that you're, you're being. So if you have that one person, what is their experience um, or engagement like? That's probably more of your metric, right? Yeah, um, yeah. One, one lens. And then, so looking at what your metrics and your measures of success, I think the other lens on one is too many is, you know, we'll do focus groups or surveys at times for organizations and we'll present the data. There's one in particular um, where there was a percent of women within the organization that felt a certain way. And they, the um, response was, well, what percent of population of women was that? 
right? Almost to, to say, is it significant enough? Is it statistically significant enough for us to do something about it? And my answer in that case was, if it's one person, you should be concerned about that, yeah. right? So there are two lenses of it, right? If it's one person that feels that way, that should be too many for you. And you might, you should want to see what is going on there. The other is if you're looking at, well, one is enough or we've met that metric, what are your metrics? Because people's stories, that's how you measure equity and inclusion. You mm -hmm. can't measure equity and inclusion necessarily with numbers, all the diversity right. can, but that tells you what you look like. Um, but, um, but looking to see what is that metric and how are we measuring success when we look at who we have within the organization? Yeah, I think that we live in a society that favors quantitative, you know, data um, over qualitative. And when it comes to experiences, especially this topic of, of belonging, equity, and inclusion, I tend to think that the qualitative um, is so much more powerful, you know. And so, and to your point, when, you know, you hear clients question, well, that's just X percentage of, you know, much a much larger population. Yeah, exactly. What I tend to challenge those organizations on, well, but let's look at the percentage once we've disaggregated this data and the population that is right. having these experiences. Yeah. That presents a different narrative that I think requires even deeper conversations because if you're going through the process of, of doing an assessment to understand the lived experiences of your employees to ensure that they are feeling a sense of belonging and acceptance and can reach their full potential, then why would you not want to see what the differences are across different demographics, right? So that's really important. The other thing that I tell people too is when you're coming up with metrics, um, there, there are times when the quantitative makes perfect sense. So don't get me wrong. I don't want to uh, diminish the value there. But I also tell people that if you're kind of starting out, sometimes we need to maybe create um, process-driven metrics. Yeah. How do we define what the process is or what the policies are? And how do we track how yeah. people are consistently following them? Because if the policy is designed to create that level of inclusion and belonging and equity, then... We're going to see, at least we should see if we're holding people accountable, right? That is going to yield some benefits towards what we are seeking as the outcomes. And so sometimes we have to, you know, think about process-driven goals um, and not just specifically what's a, a quantitative goal that we have around our DEI metrics. And so I appreciate you bringing that to uh, the conversation. Yeah, and I think that's one of those places where it's, it's the and, not the or, right? You look, yes. you need the number, and you need the experiences that gives you your whole story, yes. right? The both and, absolutely. I love that. Okay, so I'm not seeing any hands raised, but there is a question that has come forth into the chat. And this is from Michael St. Clair. Thank you, Michael, for you're, you're one of our repeat um, community <laughs> members. We always appreciate you. And uh, Michael, I don't know if you want to present your question directly. I'm gonna, I'm gonna add you to the spotlight if you don't mind and let you present your question directly. Is that okay? Okay, okay, it's okay. Go for it. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, let me see. I'm going to read. Okay. As you mentioned earlier, you were talking about how you had conversation with your son about different things as far as swimming and stuff and how the numbers changed. And I basically wanted to know, uh, did you have conversations with your children regarding D DEI? And how do you help others to learn to navigate successfully with the DEI mindset and the faces that we challenge in the world and in the workplace. Yeah, we we talk about it quite often, and my how part of it is just because they'll hear me on calls or they'll see you know some slides that I'm creating. And and, and one funny story is I was creating I did a, a deck for a DNI training, and my eldest son was in my office, and he was like, "Are you still talking about this?" <laughs> <laughs> so for them, it's not even a discussion I'm learning from them, right? It's not even like a discussion for them. You know, they educate me more on, you know, what is going on kind of and what to expect from the, the people that we're starting to hire now. Yeah. But we talk about that quite often. And, and we talk about, you know, I, I do have, you know, black boys. So we do talk about what reality for them looks mm -hmm. like. 
Um, they are in an independent school, so already their day-to-day -day is can be very isolating at times. We have a community outside of that, um, you know, that that where they feel probably more included. Um, but we talk about it quite often: what reality looks like, um, positive or not, um, what they need to do. That's part of why this international experience has been also valuable for him, um, because he's in an environment. And something he said when he came home for the holidays is that he's balancing. Being in an environment in Tokyo where he doesn't necessarily feel included visually, but he doesn't feel like a threat visually. Ah. Okay? And then yeah. when he comes home, he said he feels more included visually, but then at times, depending on where he is, his visual is a threat. So this is a 22, you know, so he's trying to figure this out. Like, what does this mean? Where do I feel more comfortable? And then I asked him, which one do you think is more comfortable? And I, I bet you could guess which one he picked, right? He would rather feel more inclusion, right. even though he knows that makes him potentially his presence more of a threat, right? So it, it's just, it's, it's been really interesting watching them and learning from them grow, but we talk about it quite often and what they can expect when they go into the workplace. Um, but I do learn a lot from them though, because the DNI changes it very quickly um, and they the kids are on top of it. <laughs> they certainly are. Yeah. Yeah. So key takeaway. I'm sorry. You're on mute, Michael. I was just going to share. I think that was a great question, Michael. So thank you so much. And oh, thank you. Um, yeah. One of the takeaways for me is that if we aren't having these conversations with our kids, we need to be. Mm -hmm. And so if they aren't bringing them up, then you bring them up. Let them express what's kind of coming up for them and how they're feeling about it. I think that's really, really useful. OK, so we have another hand raise, and this is from Jamie Craig. And so I'm going to add you to the spotlight and invite you to um, unmute yourself and share your comments or questions. Welcome. Hi, thank you. Yeah, I don't really have a question. <clears throat> I just kind of wanted to share when Tommy was talking about kind of bringing people along, um, it made me think, and, and you were talking about sports earlier, it made me think a way to compare that for people who aren't working in the DE&I space and wondering how kind of painful it is to drag people along is to think as a parent, um, if you've ever had a kid in a sport and you were having to drag them, you know, to practices and drag them to games, right? Like that's what it feels like to drag people along who don't want to necessarily be on your journey. And so sometimes you, you let your kid quit that sport, right? And maybe they try another sport. So maybe you try to redirect those employees to maybe something else they're passionate about, right? But maybe they're not into sports and maybe they're into theater and you just got to let that go and, and move on. So I just kind of wanted to share, you know, maybe a different kind of uh, analogy to the situation because I think, you know, uh, people who aren't working in that DE&I space and that HR space every day may not fully understand that whole trying to drag people along. And so if if they're parents, that's an example of, of a way, you know, think about the kid that you had to drive to a sports or drag to a sports practice and, and how painful was that, <laughs> right? That's how painful it feels when right. you're trying to drag people along. And so you just want to Bye. I'm done. I'm going <laughs> yeah. to move on. With okay, the go ahead and quit. Play Fine. This helps me, right? Yes. Right. That's so right. good, Jamie. Tell me your thoughts on that. Yeah, Um. I would not be waking up at 4 a.m. if you didn't want to go. <laughs> <laughs> so 100%. <laughs> So, so true. It's, it's so true. And like you said, they, you may have to self-select out. They may have to decide well, that's not the sport for me and let's find something else you're interested in or somewhere else. That's a better fit for you. Yeah. Yeah. I think what this brings to the conversation is how exhausting it can be when we are having to, at every turn, convince, yeah. defend, you know, reconvince, recommunicate, re-educate when you feel like, haven't we made some progress? But it's yeah. like, you're still not getting it. Okay. And um, it just reminds me, real talk, as a founder, I remember a couple of years ago, as we were going through an exercise of thinking about who was our ideal client, you know, yeah. we we are full service. We we serve a lot of different types of clients that are different places within their DEI journey, right? And so there's a broad continuum there. But our ideal client are those who we don't have to defend this yeah. work to at every turn. Yes. And there's something to be said for that, right? Yeah. So anyway, thank you so much, Jamie. Yeah, go ahead, Tommy. No, we had that moment as well. I think <laughs> and, and and for me it was um is their board on board? 
Yes. Right. Yes. And, and if the if if the first meeting was to convince the board chair that it was important, then that was not the right client for us. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, so I think we have time to catch another question. And Chloe, um, Chloe, I see that your hand is raised. And so I want to invite you to unmute yourself and share. Oh my gosh, I was trying to change one. Hi, hello. Hi. I know my Microsoft you know my there we go. <laughs> Hi, hello, tell me. Hello. How are you? So my question is how, and I put it in the chat as well if anybody wants to read it later, but as parents, how can we introduce DNI efforts? at our children's school engagement, um, mm -hmm. when you see there's a need, mm -hmm. how can you do that in a way that is, uh, I guess, a soft, like a soft lunch or a soft touch or yeah. some way to just to introduce it in a, well, it's never a, a threatening manner, but some people right. may yeah. deem it. Um, how would you say with the, did you say with the kids or with their school? Sorry. Well, with the school, like with the with school, school, whether it's the PTA or if it's um Good question. You know, just, yeah. Uh, the, the Facebook page needs a little bit more yes. engagement yeah. or yeah. <laughs> just little, little things that can be done to make it, um, even though it might be a one environment, you want to make sure that the school is presenting itself in the best way possible right, right. to maybe attract like, you know, like-minded parents. Right, right. Yeah, and I, I mentioned my boys are in independent school, so it's something that I, you know, my husband and I do quite a bit. I think they sometimes get tired of seeing us probably, <laughs> um, but it, I think what we have found that I think works the best is to really focus on the idea of representation, mm -hmm. uh, because that, again, applies to everybody. So if you're yeah. able to start at a place that applies to everybody, and then you can go from representation to why do we need representation? Because we have diversity or we don't have diversity, right? Mm -hmm. um, so that kind of is a, as a soft way because it applies to everyone. Everybody can relate to that. Um, and again, there are times where depending on what's going on, the focus of that might be different for particular groups, but it still includes everybody. Our school had a big discussion once about um, our Jewish community, because a lot of times we would still have school on certain days and the kids would still miss tests and assessments on certain days because um, it, it was a holiday that wasn't recognized, right? So from the lens of representation, we could, we could address that. Right. Also, from the realm of representation, we could address um, different things that might be going on within the community that might have related to, you know, boys of color um, in 2020, 2021, mm -hmm. right? And what they might be feeling and what resources they might need and things like that. So I think if you're able to use that representation and diversity in, um, and then you can go from there with the inclusion and equity, you know, piece of it. Then it's not so, you know, like I said, it's not always to fix a problem. It's sometimes it's not so threatening. It's just, mm -hmm. it's a human issue. There you <laughs> go. Like discussion, right. We're all human beings. So um, that seems to work well. Thank you. Yeah. You're Great. Right. Thank you, Chloe. Thank you for your question and for being here. Okay, so we have just maybe like three minutes left. And so I want to close this out in a way that um, feels good for this community. And we often like to hear some final words and remarks from our guest co-host. And so, Tony, I know there's so much more we could touch on, but what have I not asked you about today that you're feeling a lot of energy around that you want to socialize with this community? Let's see. I, I think the biggest thing that we miss or have been missing lately, and I mentioned it just a little bit with that last question, is just that the focus of all of this is be people, human beings. Like the whole focus of this whole DNI, the discussion is just that we are all human, we are all people, and the idea is creating environments where we can all be our best. It's really that simple, right? And we make it so difficult and so complicated. If we watch first graders, you know, what is allyship? We watch first graders and somebody's being mean to another one and somebody's right. there. That's allyship. It's not any more complicated than that, right? So I think if we really can focus on the idea of, I'm not always going to focus on my lens of things, um, you know, focus on those who are the most impacted and look at each other as human beings and as people and how can we help each other be our best I, if, if we look at all these situations and scenarios when you're writing if it's writing policies if it's being on a sports team if it's at school it's really yes. that simple right yeah um, so if they're parting words I think whenever you're tackling an issue that has to do with DNI but how this is let's break this down to just 
human beings trying to be at their best. Yes, yes, yes. Human beings, the humanity aspect of it is yeah. so critically important. We have really enjoyed you. And Thank I want you. to express appreciation on behalf of this entire community for sharing with us so graciously your your time, your, your insights. And um, we did place your contact information into the chat. Hope that you all will connect with Tomi and check out her website. And uh, we look forward to seeing what's on the horizon for you as we follow you, you. And, and follow your progress and wish you all of the best. Thank, uh, you. thank you to this community for joining us today. I hope you have a safe and happy weekend. And um, we'll see you hopefully next Friday here on Attentional Conversations podcast. Enjoy. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, Nika. Thank you.